Hi, my name is Star Long. Uh, we're here at CES 2015, and I'm showing off my game Shroud of the Avatar at the Plantronics booth. So let's start by talking about what this game is all about. Uh, great. So Shroud of the Avatar is a fantasy RPG that's all crowdfunded and crowdsourced. So uh, not only are we ma the developers making the game, but the players are making the game with us. For instance, all of the music in the game is made by players. Uh, about 20% of the world art is made by players. Uh, a bunch of the sound effects are made by players. So it's a group effort with them. And we pay them for all that content that they make. Now, as the game has, is out there, uh, how is it progressing and how are you working with players to push it further? So we launched on Steam Early Access a few months ago, but even before that, we've been letting our backers play every month for over a year now. So we started uh, a year ago in December, uh, letting our backers in, even when the game was in its very earliest stages where you could literally just walk by yourself around one map. And then we've slowly been adding more content and more features, and we devote about 30% of each release to direct response to player feedback uh, on a monthly basis. So what's new when it comes to this game? So uh, some of the newest things we've added are we've, we've added uh, about two to four scenes every release. So the latest release added three new scenes, including a new desert map. Uh, the release before that added new swamp areas. Uh, we added a bunch of new uh, crafting recipes for gear, armor, and weapons, uh, and the first uh, enhancements to armor and weapons that'll give you like bonuses to strengthen uh, dexterity, intelligence, things like that. Now with a traditional game, you would release a game, then you'd have to go back and do a patch based on feedback. How did having that feedback up front impact what you guys are doing with the game now? Uh, we actually think this iterative approach is going to make the game a lot better and specifically it's going to make the game better for the players who are playing it right now because they are the ones giving us that feedback. And uh, the, the best example I think is that the very first release uh, we didn't have jumping or swimming uh, just because jumping and swimming is an expensive feature. Uh, and we all hated it. Uh, but we were like, let's put it in front of the players, let's see if they're okay with it. And then the players got in and they're like, we hate it too. Like I really want to be able to jump off this step not have to walk down it. It doesn't make any sense, especially if you're building this sandbox immersive virtual world. And we agree with them. So we adjusted the schedule and we put uh, jumping and swimming in the very next release. So I think, with, I think what the advantage we get out of this process is most of the time you don't actually know till you're on the shelf or you're in the distribution platform like Steam whether you're going to be successful or not. Uh, you, yeah, you can do some market research and some initial testing and beta testing, but with this approach, we we know every month whether the game is fun or not, or whether the people who are gonna who are gonna want to play it. It's a, and so we know way way earlier if we're going wrong. When it comes to the game industry, how are you seeing crowdfunding influence what was traditionally the publisher model, where developers worked for them and got paid up, got paid at the, on the back end. Well, I think what's interesting with crowdfunding is we're getting to s what we were seeing, I think, before crowdfunding and the indie scene came along was a, a bit of a narrowing of, of focus of what kinds of games that were being made because they were costing more and more and publishers were becoming you know, more and more risk averse. What, what I think what's amazing about crowdfunding and the indie scene in general is that we're seeing this explosion of new kinds of games and, not, and games that are looking for a niche audience and that's okay. They're not trying to make a game that's going to appeal to every single player on the planet. And that's fine because we're building according to those crowdfunded or those indie level budgets and we can afford to make a game for a smaller audience. You've been around for a while. Are you seeing similarities between this new generation of garage development to back in the early PC days? Absolutely. It's it's so bizarre to feel like we've come full circle. It's 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 almost exactly like it was 20 years ago. I mean, my my team size on this current project is about the same team size as I had on the original Ultima Online 20 years ago. You know, it's about 30 people. Uh, where you know before before that, you know, I was doing you know I had teams of like 300 people. You know, up until this you know new kind of game development, new kind of game development where we're back to where we started, and it's great. You know, when we're operating at the same sort of team size and the same sort of budgets and even the same kinds of feature sets because you know we're, we're seeing at least for a segment of the audience that this nostalgic feel for games that are really challenging that that you know we've, we've done a great job as an industry making games more accessible to more people but in some cases we lost a little bit of the challenge and I think we are seeing that there's a segment of the audience who's looking for that don't hold my hand so much let me let, make the game really hard 